Thank you, Pastor Ron and Kelly. We been praying for you over this weekend as you're ministering in Virginia. Thank you for the invite. It is a privilege and an honor to be here in your pulpit today. Uh, I met Connor and Ryan first. They were the first ones that I met before I met Ron and Kelly, and it was on a golf course. And um, I spent the day making fun of them and teasing them. And I still to this day continue that tradition, and I'll do that again later this week, I'm sure, as I see them and meet up in New York. So uh, I love your pastor. I love your pastor's family. How much do you, how much do you appreciate Pastor Ron and, and Kelly? I'm telling you. He mentioned the transition that we've been in. I started in ministry in 92 and uh, continued that until, in full-time in church ministry and continued that until last December. Last December, I resigned my church to move to Springfield, Missouri to take over this fundraising organization that I have the privilege of leading. And, and it's been difficult. The transition's been, been difficult for us as a family to find that connection. We, I traveled a lot whenever I was pastoring and still working with this missions fundraising, fundraising organization, but I always had that home base, that church that I could get back to, that I could connect with, that I passed and the team that I had and, and our family was around us. And when we moved from California to Missouri, we became immediate empty nesters. Uh, we we uh, struggled to uh, just kind of uh, just get roots. And we come over and we would visit mom and dad and, and come to church here. And we've loved every time that we've been here. We've been here three different times. Basically, the only three open Sundays I've had where I haven't traveled. And we've been over here to visit. And I talked to Pastor Ron last week. And I said, you know, we want a home base. We want a place where we can land. We want a pastor that we can call our pastor. And through my conversations with him last week, I said, hey, pastor, I want to make my commitment to you that the Assembly of Broken Arrow will be our home church. I know I'm in Springfield, but we want to make this our home church. So I told him, I said, it's up to you and your team to figure out how to allow remote members that can stay home and watch you on TV. And so I'm giving you an excuse to jump in and be a part. And I'm teasing. You don't, you don't want to do that. But once again, it's a privilege to be here. Cindy and I, as mentioned, we celebrate 30 years of marriage. And I am Pastor Charles and Marilyn's third son. We have three, I have three brothers. They have four boys. I'm the third of the four boys. Can I explain that situation, that scenario real quick? Just let me take a brief second before I get started. My position in the family is the third, okay? Uh, how many thirds do we have in here? You got third? Okay. We got several thirds, my people, all right? So the firstborn, what happens is mom and dad have the firstborn son and they realize, you know what? This isn't good enough. We need to try again. <laughs> so they have a second one. And they go, wow, this was really not good. We need to try again. They have the third one and they realize they hit perfection. All my thirds said amen. <laughs> so then they get so excited about it. They said, you know what? This one was so perfect. Let's try for a fourth. They have the fourth boy and they realize we really messed up. We should have stayed with the third. So you with me? That's my position and I'm sticking to it in my family. Here we are on the 4th of July holiday weekend. We're celebrating the freedom we've been given by living in this great country. We've, I've traveled the world as probably some of you have. I've traveled over places where they don't experience the freedoms that we experience here in America. And I, I really, truly appreciate the country that we live in. There's no place like the United States of America. Just last week, my wife and I were in the Capitol. We were in Washington, D.C. We had to go there for a fundraising event. We went in a few days early. We stayed downtown, literally one block away from, from the White House and right across the street from the mayor's building there. And we got on those bird scooters, you know, those electric scooters. I, I'm almost 50 years old and shouldn't be riding scooters, but we did it. And we went all the way around all the whole Capitol building and the monuments and everything. And it was amazing. It's humbling to stand in the shadows of those monuments and to read the inscriptions on the wall and, and to understand and truly appreciate the freedoms that we have. There is no place like America. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a couple of stories today. I'm going to share what God has laid on my heart. And, and I want to get started with, with telling you a story about a guy. This guy's name is Louis Delcour. Louis Delcour was a private in the French Army, Army Infantry Division in World War I. There was two great battles that happened in the year of 1916, if you know your history. And the Battle of Verdun was early in the year. And later on, the Battle of Somme later was, was a, just a tremendous battle that happened. Louis was 
deciding that he had had enough. He, he was a, there was a famine in the French, French troops. There, there weren't enough food. There weren't enough supplies. Times were bleak. So he decided to, to simply walk away, to desert. He left the battlefield. He headed for home. Along with Louis, there were some 66,678 recorded French troops that deserted between 1914 and 1918. It it represented less than 1% of the total number of troops in the battle. It didn't really affect the outcome of the war, but but Louis' story is just a little bit more interesting than the other 66,000 who walked away. The scripture I want to share with you today is Galatians chapter five, verse one. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And I've titled today's message, Live Free. Let's pray as we get started. God, I thank you for your word. Your word is powerful. It is true. It is alive today. It rings truth from generation to generation. It speaks to us in such a way that it guides our everyday steps. It guides our thoughts. It guides our actions. Lord, your word has promises that that we have read and we have tapped into, but there's so much more that it unlocks in our lives. So God, I pray today that your word would ring true in our hearts and in our lives, that we would truly know what it means to live free. Speak to us today, God, we pray in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. Amen. I'm going to start with three key ways that we can experience freedom in Christ. The first one is this, walk in truth. I I, I want to ask you a question. We're in church. It's time for confession. How many has ever told a lie? Okay, many, many hands. So altar time today will be filled when I was a kid, my parents can tell you, and I'm sure I, we were joking about this earlier this morning as we were meeting and preparing to come out, and, and, and we were talking about illustrations and storytelling, and my dad loves to tell stories if you've been in his classes. Every story, if, he, if he's ever told a story about me, no matter how outrageous it sounds, I can guarantee you it is true. I just want to make that a promise to you. I, I had a problem when I was a kid, when I was young, with lying. I would, I would lie. I don't, I don't know why. I just felt it was easier to tell a lie than it was to tell the truth. Mom would ask, did you clean your room? Yes. Did you do your homework? Yes. Did you eat all your Brussels sprouts? Yes. If you ever ask me to this day if I ate all my Brussels sprouts and I say yes, it is a lie. <laughs> it is a vile weed. <laughs> I got an amen. I, Seriously, who was the person that went out into a field and saw that thing in the ground and said, you know what, let's cook it up. And then after smelling the smell of Brussels sprout, they smell like vomit, and said, you know what, I want to taste it, and I want to see what it tastes like, and then serve it on a plate. Here's the thing about lying. It's easier to tell a lie, and it's harder to tell the truth. Many situations we face in life where it becomes a little bit easier to to just, oh yeah, it's going to be all right. Things are going to be okay. It's easier to tell the lie and sometimes it's harder to tell the truth. You know what? You need to know the truth in this situation. Mom and dads, you, I've got three girls. I've got two grandbabies, another one on the way. Uh, we know this. We know that sometimes it's easier to lie to our kid. When, when a child comes to you with a drawing of something and says to you, you know, you can't even comprehend it. And they say, look, mommy, I, I drew this for you. Look, daddy, I drew this for you. And you have to respond with a lie. It's so beautiful. Have you been there? And, and you stick it on the fridge and it remains there for everybody to see it, Right? And when people come over and they ask, oh, well, what is this? Oh, you have to lie again. Well, well can't you tell what it is? What do, what do you think it is, you know? I, I found these pictures of a parent that took their kids' drawings and turned them into real pictures. Check this out. Maybe you've seen this. Here's a giraffe. There's a giraffe that they took and he, and he turned it into a real. The next one is, is a horse. They took a picture of a horse and turned it into a a real horse out on a field. My favorite is the last one. It's a self-portrait of the dad. The dad photoshopped himself to match the self-portrait. I'm joking a bit when I tell talk about these kinds of lies, but let's be honest with ourselves and with God in this moment. How many times do we, do we find it easier to lie than to tell the truth? How many times do we think that we are, we are saving ourselves from some kind of trouble when we tell a lie? Did you finish the task you were assigned? 
Were you here on time? Did you make those calls? Did you follow up on that contact? Were you honest on your job application? I grew up with the saying, the truth will always find you out. Before I got a whooping when I grew up, and yes, I got a whooping and I turned out okay. Not great, but okay. I would get sermons before I would get whooped. The truth will always find you out. And let me tell you, that's true. When you tell a lie, you're now bound to live out that lie. You have to stick with it or you'll, you'll be found out for the liar that you are. Well, here's the thing about living a lie. It's actually harder to live a lie than it is to walk in truth. Living in truth is realizing that God knows who we are. When we walk in truth, he, he knows our thoughts, he knows our actions, he knows everything about us. We can't lie to God when we pray and when we're honest with God, he already knows. So being real with God and, and telling him everything in truth, trust me, God can handle it. There's been many times I've gone in prayer, God, I cannot handle this situation. I can't go through this time. When other people ask me, oh yeah, I'm doing fine. Have you been there? You're going through a tough situation with a family member, with a coworker, and, and, and you want to tell them certain things. Take it to God. He can handle it. Tell him the truth. God, that person rubs me the wrong way. I can't stand the way that they smack their gum. I don't like them. It's okay. Tell God that. But what's going to happen is God's going to put you in a situation where you're going to have to grow and learn through that, but that's another sermon. <laughs> Psalms chapter 145, verse 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call on him to all who call on him in truth. How many's ever heard the phrase, honest to God? How many's ever said the phrase, honest to God? Anybody? Okay. One of my pet peeves is when I'm talking to someone and they say to me, let me be honest with you for a minute. I'm, you've been lying to me? <laughs> There's a book written in 1963 by an Anglican bishop named John Robinson titled, Honest to God. The funny thing about the book is that it's full of lies about God and his word. The author claims that our image of God must go, that a, a secular man requires a secular theology. Basically, the viewpoint of is that God changes with the times, that he adapts to our culture and he adapts to our secularism and our current society. How many thank God that he doesn't operate like that? The book was rebutted by many theologians. However, it gained traction with several who had more liberal views towards Christianity. They were, they were accepting of people's secular practices that went against the holiness that's required to live a godly life found in God's word. I want to say this real quick about secularism, some modern, view, modern views on Christianity that are counter to God's word. Just because you're accepting of it doesn't make it truth. If you want to walk in truth, the truth is found in God's word. Just because you're accepting of something that's happening currently doesn't make it truth. Is it founded in scripture? Is it found in God's word? Is it backed up by what God says? The timing of this book, Honest to God, was at a critical point in our nation's history. You see, in 1962, there was a particular prayer that was prayed that sparked a controversial Supreme Court ruling that forever changed the nation and has gone against its founding principles. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings on us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. The Union Free School District in Hyde Park, New York, prayed this prayer every morning with students. A student could be dismissed from this prayer time upon a written note of excuse from their parents. However, this 22-word, eight-second-long prayer was declared to be unconstitutional and led to the removal of all prayers from public schools in the Supreme Court case of Engel versus Vital. This little prayer acknowledges God only one time. The Declaration of Independence itself acknowledges God four times. The inscriptions we saw on the wall of the memorials and the monuments that we visited. In Jefferson's statement, there was over 12 times he acknowledged God. In Lincoln's address on Gettysburg, he acknowledged God 16 times. In his inauguration address, he acknowledged God more than 20 times. One time in this prayer. Within 12 months, from 1962 to 1963 of Engel versus Vital, in two more Supreme Court cases, Abington versus Shimp and Murray versus Curlett, the court completely removed Bible reading, religious classes, and all instruction 
from schools. This was a radical reversal of law and all without precedential justification or constitutional base. The court's justification for removing Bible reading from public schools declared that 3% of the nation who professed no belief in religion, no belief in God, although this prayer was consistent with 97% of the beliefs of the people of the United States, the court decided for the 3% against the majority. The book, Honest to God, was written during this time and released in 1963. It was a further spark to a simmering fire of rebellion against God and his word. Let me tell you something. God's word never changes. When we pray, he hears and answers because his word says so. When we call on him, he is with us because his word said so. When we agree together, he answers because his word says so. The Supreme Court justices ruling and reasoning for removing God and prayer from schools was justified that without proper teaching, certain scriptures from the New Testament can be found confusing and perhaps lead a child in a bad direction. Woe to them that call evil good. The truth a lie, right, wrong. Basically, They were saying scripture could be interpreted incorrectly without proper teaching. How many appreciate Bible Engagement Project? How many thank God for the teaching, the instruction, the discipleship? You want want to walk in truth? Get in God's word. Learn everything you can about it. Apply it to your daily life. I love Psalms chapter 86, verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. The only way to live truly free is to be honest with God, honest with yourself, and honest with others, and place his word as the true authority over your life. How else do we live free? Number two, I I put in here, be strong in faith. Be strong in faith. Nowadays, we're challenged on every front. We can't read or watch the news or even open social media without feeling attacked in some way. No matter what you believe or what you think, there are those that are out to convince you that your ideas and your beliefs are wrong and you need to change. It's amazing how the word of God is being lived out right before our eyes. Paul, in writing to Timothy, prophesied this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. And that's just a visit to Walmart. I know this sounds cliche-ish, if that's a word, but it can't be more clear we are living in the last days. The time has come for us to stand up for our faith, to take a stance for the freedoms we have in Christ Jesus, to be strong in our faith. One of the things that tied my heart to your pastor and to this church, I was sitting right over here visiting my parents. It was election week when we visited that week and your pastor stood up and talked about the importance of our children and protecting the birth of our children. My heart immediately tied in to your pastor and to this church to take a stand for our faith. Paul warned Timothy that these times are upon us and his final words of encouragement are words for us today to be strong in faith. Second Timothy chapter three continues in verse 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Does that sound like good news? You want to live for God? You're going to be persecuted. Hooray. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Taking a stand in faith that God is our authority. Making decisions for our lives and for our families that Jesus comes first. Not compromising with the world. Standing firm in our faith and seeing God do amazing things in our life. (laughs) 
I want to close with this, and this is the last one, the title of the message for this point, Live Free. Live Free. Let's go back to Louis' story real quick. Louis went AWOL, took off, deserted, ran back to his home, persuaded his mother to hide him up in the attic of their home. There she hid him and fed him for 21 years. How many parents here have got kids living at home? No, come on. You got kids living at home. I'm talking about kids that shouldn't be living at home. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Not little kids. I'm talking about the kids that should be having kids for you. We had a daughter that just got married recently. She's expecting our, our most recent grandbaby to do in October. And, and she, we, I mean, she had boyfriends. They were, we thought, you know, this is the one. Get her out of the house. Praise God. God finally blessed us with a great son-in-law. And she's an amazing girl. Don't get me wrong. But man, when we became empty nesters, there's a, an excitement and a freedom that's there. I mean, still, we miss the kids, right? Yeah, but we still, we love each other, right? Thank you. <laughs> 21 years she hid her son in the attic, feeding him, keeping him hidden out in the attic. 21 years, 1916 to 1937. In 1937, Louis' mother died. There was no chance now of remaining in hiding. Louis knew that the punishment for deserters was death. They would either be shot or be hung. There was no other option. That was the law. However, he had no choice but to admit his crimes and turn himself in. There was no one else to provide for him. So pale and haggard, Louis staggered along to the nearest police officer where he gave himself up. The police officer looked at him in shock and asked him, where have you been hiding that you have not heard? Haven't heard what? Louis replied. Police officer responded, there was a law of amnesty for all deserters that was passed years ago. A law that if broken was punishable by death and without knowing it, Louis was free to live from that punishment but remained imprisoned. Louis had the freedom, but he didn't enjoy it because he didn't know the freedom that he truly had. It's the same with many Christians today. We've been set free by Jesus Christ, but we're not truly living in the freedom that comes from knowing Christ. We've been set free from sin through Jesus, and it's for that freedom from sin that, that we can live free, but many still live bound by, by the guilt or the shame of the past. They still live as a slave to that sin. While they've, they've been given freedom from it, they haven't truly conquered it. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I want to invite the worship team to come. I can't tell you how many times that I've seen someone get delivered by God. God, God sets them free and then, then time after time they slip right back into their old ways and they fall right back into the sinful patterns. There are two, two ways there are two ways that people see Jesus. The first is this. We see him as Savior. We, we see him as the Savior of our souls, the, the, the rescuer who, who sets us free, the, the one who comes at any time we call. We see him as a Savior, which is true and which is good, and we call him and we need him as Savior. But what happens a lot of the times is that we stop right there. We experience living free, being set free for a short while, and we fail to take the next step when it comes to Jesus. We, we fail to place him as Lord over our lives. Lord over every area of our lives. Lord over our thoughts. Lord over our actions. Lord over our, our families. Lord over our money. Lord over our possessions. Lord over our gifts and talents. We, we see him as Savior, and we call on him when there's trouble, and we run to him when we need a Savior. It's when we serve God and we place him as Lord over our life that we experience the true freedom that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. John chapter 8 says it this way in verse 32. He says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. He continues on in verse 36. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. I'm a pastor, so forgive me. I'm, 
Uh, it's a new dynamic to be a guest speaker, to speak in a guest way. So my heart is for the individual, to see an individual grow in their walk with Christ. So as a pastor, I look at things and I look at scriptures and I think, God, what are you speaking to us today? So if you allow me just a moment to speak from the heart, to share from a pastor's heart, I'm gonna tell you this morning with no heads bowed, every eye open, everyone looking, if you are still bound to the same sin that God has already set you free from through salvation and knowing Jesus Christ, God wants to fully deliver you today. God wants to set you free so that you can be free indeed. Listen, I know, I know it gets a little tough. We battle things. There, there are public sins and there are hidden sins. And it's usually those hidden sins that, that we struggle with the most to release and to let go and to get true victory from. Today, God's speaking to you. He wants to set you free. Now, for just a moment, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you were invited by a family or a friend to come and be a part of this service over this holiday weekend that you're visiting with, or maybe, maybe you just saw an advertisement or were invited by someone else to come and be a part of the church this morning. Maybe you don't know Jesus or you've been walking in sin and you've been, been living a lie. Today is the day, now is the time of salvation. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I wanna give you that opportunity to, to surrender your life to him. With every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, it's between you and God in this moment. If that's you this morning, you say, you know what? I need to change my life. There, there's things that need to change. I need to, I need to walk in truth. I, I need to understand what it is to be strong in faith. I want to live free. If that's you this morning, just simply raise your hand. I want to pray a simple prayer with you. If that's you this morning, before you leave, get it settled before you and God. Just raise your hand and say, Jim, that's me. Yes, sir. I see your hand. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You can put it down. Is there anyone else that will join these six? This morning, we're going to pray a simple prayer. And once again, as a pastor, I want to, I want to just pray it out loud. And I would love for everyone to repeat it so that these that are going to pray it don't feel singled out. But would you all join with me and pray this prayer with me? Say, dear Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. Come be Lord of my life. I surrender it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you celebrate these with me this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For the rest of us, would you stand before we're dismissed this morning? I believe God's speaking to us. I believe God's speaking to you as an individual. I believe God has a word for you today that he's telling you it's time to be free. It's time to live free. It's time to have that experience and true freedom that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been battling something for a temporary season. Maybe something that, that you thought you had victory over and it came back, it snuck back and you want true freedom today. Freedom comes from knowing what Jesus did for you. But not only that, it comes from declaring and being strong and saying, God, you've set me free. I'm gonna live in that freedom freedom. So today we're just going to declare it this morning. Say with me, I am free. Come on, say it louder than that. Because of what Jesus did, because of what he did on the cross, because he has set you free, you are free indeed. So say it like free people. Say, I am free. Come on, shout it out this morning. Now let's lift our hands and give him thanks. God, I thank you that you have set us free. Lord, I thank you for the freedom we have from knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And so we worship you today and we celebrate the freedom from knowing who Jesus Christ is. God, I pray that you would strengthen us in our faith, that you would help us to grow bold in our faith, that we would take a stand, that we wouldn't be easily persuaded to go to the right or the left, but to stay true to who you are. God, I thank you that we know who you are and we know that we have that freedom that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that we are free because of what Jesus did, and we can live free indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you give him praise this morning?